I'm going to begin with a recollection of when I was a child. I was in grade school, early grade school, I think, fourth or fifth grade. And I was very fascinated by the planets and the stars. And um, as a matter of fact, I have a slight scar here. Once I was looking at a telescope in a store and it was chained to the wall, but the chain had some slack and I touched it, came down and bumped me on the eye and I needed three stitches. But anyway, I had a relative, I thought of him as an uncle, but he might've been a cousin, but he was much older and he called me space. I hope that didn't have the connotation of spaced out or spacey at the time, but he did that because I talked about the planets and the stars. And I remember at night, I lying in bed sometimes and imagining I was writing a letter and I put a return address that began with my name and then had my street address and then had the my state, Pennsylvania, and then the United States of America, and then Earth, and then solar system, and then universe. And that kind of thing faded. Uh, I haven't, you know, haven't done it for decades, but I, it's it's a memory that brings a smile to my face. And I think that for many decades, and probably for many people, maybe even their whole lives, we live in a smaller world. I imagine to take this to an extreme. Let's imagine a medieval surf. I once read that some of them never went more than a few miles from where they were born in their whole life. So we can imagine a surf who's never been more than three or four mountains away from his village. And uh, maybe he's once been to a bigger city close by that had 10 or 20,000 people. And he maybe imagines the sky is kind of a dome, kind of a large bowl that covers the earth. And his view of time, if he was a, within a Christian country, might be that the earth, uh, that the Garden of Eden and, and the heavens and earth were created maybe six to 10,000 years ago, which if he's uh, 20 or 30 years old, 10,000 years is a large amount of time. But in a way, he's living in a, a kind of a psychic shell, a cosmic egg, a security blanket, let's say. He's living in a tiny space, in space and in time. And today, things are somewhat different. We can get on a jet and fly to the other side of the earth. And on the, even if we don't live near a huge city, we can see them in our movies, in our TV shows. And we know today that the earth well, the universe is about 13 point something billion years old. A billion being a thousand, thousand, thousands. So you get a thousand and get a thousand of them, you've got a million. Get a thousand of them and you've got a billion. The size of the universe today we know is basically unimaginable. There are, I read once, 10 times as many stars in the known universe as there are grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. If you watch some astronomy clips, say on YouTube, you, you, can, you can see that uh, the Milky Way is huge, but it's just one galaxy among trillions of galaxies. It's unimaginable. And in space and in time, we're a very, very small part. And then I myself, even on the earth, if I limit myself to the earth, I'm one of seven point something billion people. And my time on earth, well, I'm 71. And if I live to 91, that's probably above average for a man. And that's 20 years. And then I'll be gone. And these facts are ignored by I would say most people, most of the time, including myself. But it seems to me that these are elementary facts of our existence. And to take them into consideration, somehow 
enlarges us. We could call it expanded consciousness in a way, expanded consciousness of the basic facts of our existence. And we could even call it cosmic consciousness, consciousness of the cosmos. Now there's a famous book by that name, Cosmic Consciousness, and it gets into more, uh, I think if I remember correctly, a spiritual aspect of, in our theology, it might be not only consciousness of our place in the universe, but some kind of direct experience of the ultimate ground of existence. But I feel that the, the need for a cosmic egg, a, a, a small confined space is it's a genuine need, but I think it, we should try to uh, transcend it. Uh, maybe some of the owls of the earth come from people whose worldview is too small, too selfish, too narrow, who don't take in the, uh, the big picture. I want to pause for a second. I was um, thinking that this idea of a person with, in our sense of, the sense I just mentioned of cosmic consciousness or expanded consciousness, it begins to take natural theology kind of in the direction of religion. Uh, religions often talk about um, Christianity has the idea of the new man, uh, St. Paul, I don't live, but Christ lives in me. And it gets to the idea of a more evolved human. Now, I know I'm using that in a colloquial sense, and it's an improper sense. Uh, evolution doesn't have some goal in mind where we get better and better. It has survival of the fittest, and if we do, in some sense, get better, well, that's just the way it turned out. But the idea of a person who could fully confront the basic facts of our existence, because those facts can be depressing our finite time, our finite, finiteness in general, the finiteness and uh, smallness of the whole earth could be very depressing, very um, something we don't want to think about. But someone who could look at that full on and uh, find hope and even joy in it rather than depression might be considered uh, somewhat of an involved person something in the direction of the new man of Christianity in our theology. If that happened, which is kind of a long stretch, a long shot, but I can imagine such people kind of being venerated in a natural theology, but I think that would be wrong. I remember seeing a film, I don't know if it was historically accurate, but it was set in Tibet and there were two warring tribes and all of a sudden the war stopped and they all knelt down and it was because the Dalai Lama and some monks were passing and the monks were shielding their eyes like this so they wouldn't have to see the evil of the war. And the in that culture, the religious people had such veneration that that could happen. And when I say that the fighting stopped, you might think like, well, in a video game, you just pause it. But imagine fighting where people are dying, where you're seeing your friends killed. Your adrenaline would be through the roof. And it would be very hard to stop yourself. But in that film, anyway, everyone did. And that veneration of uh, people that are supposedly more, let's say, evolved spiritually has been common. And I, I think it's in a way wrong. I've known uh, in college, there were people who will, let's say, uh, this is an analogy, but there were people who were very intelligent, who were not very nice human beings. Um, I remember the story once of this full professor decided he didn't like the chair that, would, that, that you know, in his office. And he walked down the hall and he walked into the office of another professor. And there was this young uh, administrative assistant there. And he basically took her chair. He intimidated her. Walked in, said, you know, get up. This is the story that I heard. Gave her his chair and just took hers. It was a very um, mean thing to do. And I guess my point is that even if someone, even if uh, natural theology that I'm expounding was entirely accepted and people who had some sort of consciousness could be verified, some sort of evolved consciousness could be verified, 
still might not be very nice people. And if, if someone has this expanded consciousness, then they ought to be helping more. I mean, there are many kinds of excellences. Maybe this is one, but the nurse, the teacher, the firefighter, the policeman, the physician, all serve humanity, all help us. And if someone were to have some sort of expanded consciousness, maybe they were to be in there helping even more, not uh, expecting some kind of reverence. Well, this has been kind of a very speculative offshoot of what I began with. But um, I think it's an interesting point. But coming back to the beginning, if we can't even face the basic facts of our existence, then I think we're hiding. We're living in something of a cosmic egg. And or it's some it's a it's a maybe a mental security blanket. And that's fine. Security blankets are fine for children, but I think that maybe part of growing up and maturing include uh, facing the uh, basic facts of our existence. Thank you.